Good evening, everybody. My name is Susan Wingraff, and I'm the council representative for District 6 in the city of Berkeley. Thank you all for attending tonight, for taking time out of your busy lives to be here with us. We have a program packed with information for you tonight. And I know it's difficult to imagine wildfire season with all the rain we've gotten, but the National Weather Service is predicting a scorching summer that will dry out the vegetation growth from our rainy winter and likely fuel catastrophic fires well into the fall. More than 100 fires are already burning in Canada, and it's only May. Our goal is for you to learn what the city has accomplished in its planning and what we need to do together as individuals and as a community going forward. I'd like to turn the floor over to Mayor Jesse Erdogan now to say a few words. Well, thank you, Council Member Wengraff. I wanna first thank you for hosting this annual Community Fire Safety Town Hall. And this webinar is an opportunity to learn about important initiatives the city is leading to reduce vegetation, help homeowners harden homes and properties, and promote emergency preparedness and fire mitigation. And uh, I just want you to know that Council Member Wengraff is not just a local, but regional champion for fire safety. And we're so fortunate for her leadership on our behalf. I just want to acknowledge that this is the first uh, fire safety town hall that David Sprague is participating as our permanent fire chief with the city council confirming his appointment this past Tuesday. And under Chief Sprague's leadership, which you hear about today, Berkeley has launched a wildland urban interface unit conducting proactive outreach to residents, but fire mitigation strategies and leading a variety of efforts that you'll hear about tonight. All of this is thanks to the unprecedented investment made possible by the passage of Measure FF in November by the voters of Berkeley. And the city council moved quickly to allocate $12.5 million in up funding from Measure FF to get staff and programs on the ground to address the immediate threat of wildfire. I also want to acknowledge that this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 1923 Berkeley fire, which started in Wildcat Canyon and spread as far down as Shattuck Avenue, consuming 640 structures in its path. And we also remember the devastating Berkeley Oakland Hills firestorm in 1991, which destroyed over two, uh, 2,800 homes and took the lives of 25 people. So Berkeley is not immune from the growing threat of wildfire. And we know we've seen intense fires devastating uh, communities throughout the state of California due to drier temperatures and vegetation, a prolonged drought, although that um, is no longer the case, um, and the worsening impacts of climate change. The growing threat of wildfire is an example of the real-time impacts of our climate emergency. And so we must be prepared and we must adapt to this new reality. I'm proud that Berkeley, thanks to the support of the community and the leadership for Berkeley Fire, is a regional leader in wildfire safety and prevention. We know that we don't have time to wait. We need to act now. So that's why we're here tonight. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mayor Aragin, for your kind words and for your unwavering support of my work and the work of our fire department as we try to cope with the challenges of wildfire in our city. I also want to recognize that Councilmember Humbert and Councilmember Hahn have been extremely supportive of my initiatives and helping me promote tonight's program. Now for some housekeeping. This meeting is being recorded uh, so that you can go back and watch it again. And those people who were not able to make it tonight will be able to view it. Um, after the fire department's presentation, if we have time, we will take questions from the audience. All questions will be asked verbally using the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. But before we get started with the presentation, I want to acknowledge the neighborhood groups who have been certified as FireWise communities. One of the fire department strategies is to organize neighborhoods one by one to become FireWise. And we already have five neighborhoods who have stepped up and organized. And I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge them. The Acacia Neighborhood FireWise community was the first neighborhood to get certified. It includes 14 households and was led by Allison Kidder. The, the group has exceeded their first year's goals five times over. 
The second group was the Park Hills Homeowners Association Firewise Community. This includes 220 households, and it's clearly the largest one that we have. Carol Curtis organized this application, and the board of the uh, HOA is extremely involved in achieving their Firewise goals. San Diego Indian Rock Firewise Community includes 49 households. The leaders of that group are Mary Beth Ray, Linda Laskowski, and Tina DeBenedictus. They just got started planning their first meeting since they were certified. The Boynton, Florida Neighborhood Firewise Group includes 72 households. Kathy Ashheim chairs the five-person committee, which includes Robin Beauchamp, Kathy Ritter, Bill Buchholz, and Joan Hollinger. And their first project is getting all 72 households to participate in the CHIPA program. And just certified in March is the Fairlawn Firewise community, which includes 45 households. Frederick Winberg, Claire de Chazelle, Andy Cassidy, Robin Johnson, and Tom Hutchinson led that effort. And we have 15 more neighborhoods in the pipeline who have started to organize for certification. In addition, I want to let you know about one other group, and that is the Hillside Fire Safety Group, which has recently morphed into the Berkeley Fire Safe Council. The Berkeley Fire Safe Council has as its primary focus reducing the risk of catastrophic fire in Berkeley. They've conducted 25 fuel reduction events using an innovative approach with UC Berkeley student volunteers and with support from the city. They've removed an estimated 75 tons of hazardous fuel from inside the city. And I wanna thank Henry De Niro, especially who has led this effort. It, it was under his initiative that we started, uh, that he started this program and that the city came on board in support. So, this is really inspirational that we've been able to move so quickly to organize neighborhoods. We have a lot of work ahead of us to continue to do this, but I, I just am thrilled that so many people have stepped up. So now um, it's time for the presentation, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our very new fire chief, David Sprague, who was just confirmed on Tuesday night as our permanent fire chief. And um, I can't say, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have Chief Sprague on board as our fire chief. He has absolutely hit the road running with all of uh, these innovations and new programs um, under Measure FF. So Chief Sprague, take it away. Thank you, Councilmember Wengraf. Um, much appreciate the introduction and Thank you for you and the mayors and everybody else on council's unwavering support on these issues. Uh, it's an incredibly um, challenging, difficult path that we're on, but as a community, uh, that is the key to being successful here. So tonight we're here to give our annual update on fire readiness in the city of Berkeley. I'm joined here tonight by several of my colleagues, Deputy Fire Chief Keith May, Office of Emergency Services Manager Sarah Lana, Wildfire Inspector Duncan Allard, and we've got a special guest, Fire Chief from Moraga Rinda Fire and Berkeley High graduate, along with myself, Dave Winnegar. So tonight we're going to review the fire threat in Berkeley and what we're doing as a, a city to help this, these efforts, and most importantly, the actions that all of us can take as residents to improve the wildfire safety of our homes and our neighborhoods. I'd like to start off by introducing Dave Winokur. Again, he's the fire chief for the Marinda Araga Fire District. Uh, he's also the um, chair of the California Fire Chiefs Wildland Urban Interface Committee, and um, just outside of Berkeley by a couple of houses in Albany. But uh, Chief Winokur has been um, involved in this, these issues for the last, uh, the last several years and has been um, a huge source of infor information and inspiration for 
for me. Um, he has a unique perspective in that he is not only engaged and involved at a local level, but he is working at a state and national level to influence policy and um, drive changes that are uh, much larger and exciting. So I wanted to have him on to talk a, a little bit about what he's doing and um, some important points that uh, I think he could share with us. Chief? Thanks, Chief. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, for the, the group, I would call your attention to the right side of the slide showing the fire history in the Bay Area going back to 1900. And the thing that really should stand out is that fire is a natural and recurrent feature of the Mediterranean counties of California and the Bay Area is no exception. In our area, according to research done at UC Berkeley, the natural fire return interval is every three to five years. And while we've systematically excluded wildfire from the landscape for the last 120 years or so, we haven't stopped photosynthesis. And that's resulted in enormous accumulations of combusted fuel in the landscape. At the same time, we have imported non-native species such as Monterey pine eucalyptus that are particularly combustible. And we have built homes in the wildland urban interface, such as the Berkeley Hills. If you note the left side, the blow up of the map showing the East Bay, we see that fires have burned out of the parklands to the east in 1923 and 1991 specifically, but also in 1905 and 1970 with the fish fire in the Oakland Hills. And all of these fires occurred in the fall months, September and October primarily, when we experienced Diablo winds out of the north and northeast. And it's a particularly troubling time of year because the rains have been, it's been so long since there has been any wetting rain that the vegetation is dried out and desiccated. And then a Diablo wind, which is not necessarily characterized by very hot days, but is characterized by high wind speeds and very low relative humidities, further desiccate that vegetation and set conditions for destructive wildfire, as has occurred in this area in 1923 and 1991. Next slide, please. And and in, as you may think, but in a year such as this, when we've had so much rain, that certainly we, we won't have this problem. Note here, there's the thousand hour fuel graph from last year, a, a year where winter just never really happened. And we had a very dry spell, we had a lack of rains, and the blue line represents what the thousand hour fuel moisture levels were as of March 7th last year. They, they'd fallen very low, which would be expected in a dry year. Next slide, please. And then we see from this year, from the end of April, where we see the wetting influence of those heavy atmospheric river fed rains that we had throughout the winter. And we see how quickly we have fallen from those very wet periods to now we are dropping down around the minimum levels for fuel moisture levels. Now this graph is slightly updated by the rain of last week, but within a week or two, we'll be back on track for a, a very dry, a very uh, uh, combustive environment that is conducive to rapid wildfire spread. Because the only elements that influence a wildfire are topography, weather, and fuel. The topography is unchanging and not necessarily very helpful, particularly in the Berkeley Hill regions. The weather is bad is getting, and getting worse with climate change caused compression of the rainy season, meaning we're exposed to more and more of those fall wind events. But the fuel is the part we have control over. It's what gives us agency to reduce our exposure to wildfire risk different from hazard. Hazard is the, the thing that can occur, risk is the probability of it occurring. And as we reduce the presence of receptive fuel beds and combustive vegetation, particularly in close to the homes, we can dramatically reduce our exposure to wildfire loss. Next slide, please. Because when wildfire occurs, it is only when those wildfire cause losses of the values at risk, specifically homes and the lives that live within those homes that we need to be concerned about. We've done quite a bit of work of late understanding how the insurance industry and specifically how catastrophe risk models view the problem and what work we can do scientifically based mitigations with actuarially sound accounting for what effect those may have to show the, the manner in which mitigations Kagan carried out at a community scale can reduce the average annual loss weighted against the total insured value to drive down not only the price, but to increase the availability and the reliability of insurance. I think this is critically important for everyone to understand because wildfire is largely an abstract problem. In any given year, your average Californian is unlikely to directly experience wildfire loss. But insurance is an annual problem. Policies cannot be written for more than 12 months at a time. And as the insurance industry experiences significant losses, they are going to seek to withdraw from areas where they feel that the risk of loss 
outweighs the, the opportunities they have to successfully carry out their business. And communities have a finite amount of time to stay ahead of that. You can stay ahead of that through carrying out mitigations at a community-wide level. And as this study was done, which was a, a test, uh, a case study, if you will, done in the Moraga Orinda jurisdiction, if fewer than 30% of the homes within a given area have carried out mitigation, it is actuarially insignificant. There is no benefit given. So we need to see an aggregation of mitigated homes and organization through things such as FireWise and Fire Safe Councils and the actions that the city is taking and that your fire department is taking to encourage this work to be done. And when mitigations are carried out at scale and with the appropriate density at the parcel level in conjunction with fuel mitigation efforts in the buffers, the, the wildland or open spaces which surround a community, average annual loss can be reduced by up to 81.5% for the wildfire peril portion of the policy. That's tremendously good news. I think it's important to understand that these are the component parts that make up the manner in which wildfire uh, peril is priced and translates into not only premiums, but access to insurance. And we have agency. We have the ability to mitigate these risks. And when we do so at community scale, we can rapidly drive down this risk and the associated challenges with insurance. I really appreciate the opportunity to to come and share with you what we have been doing. We are tremendously excited as the Moraga Rinda Fire District for the partnership of the Berkeley Fire Department and the city of Berkeley. We all share a border running along the Berkeley Oakland Hills. And when we work together, I think we can very quickly move the needle to buy down our risk. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Go Jackets. All right, so let's quickly review um, something that probably everybody intuitively knows, but putting some numbers to it can be powerful. What has changed? The graphic you see on the right represents uh, the total acreage loss due to wildfire since 1932. And you can see in the upper right quadrant, the, uh, the green cells are represent about 70 years, 1932 to 1999. During that time period, about we lost about 500,000 acres. And you can see in the subsequent, um, subsequent years, uh, 20 years, we lost over 4 million acres. So it's, you know, weather is changing, the change in weather drives change in fuel moisture and um, weather, weather patterns are changing. Uh, we're getting the more condensed wet periods which change vegetation growth and that just drives. And then of course we're building into these wildland areas. So that just drives larger, more aggressive, uh, more difficult to stop wildfires. This is not something that's likely to change. Of course, we may have uh, some peaks and valleys in this trend, but generally speaking, this is something that is not gonna be getting better. So we do have to take steps to prepare. This coming fire season, we have initial projections from CAL FIRE that just last th uh, through the next couple of months. Uh, we still need to see what happens with the weather over the next month or so before they can give projections for the kind of uh, peak of the fire season, which will be in September, October. What we know right now is that due to the significant rains uh, and the late rains that have been um, intermingled with um, sun sunny days and warm weather, we're going to have significant understory growth. Understory growth are you know the the lighter, flashier fuels on the ground. So the grasses, the the shrubs, um, we're going to get more dense vegetation on the ground. Um, that's going to dry out faster because it retains uh, moisture for a shorter amount of time once the heat hits. And that means we're going to have um, likely more significant ground fires. So those fires move faster. Um, so places like the Altamont will probably be burning like they haven't burned in a number of years. The good news is that those fires are more easily suppressed by uh, ground resources and aircraft are really effective at controlling those fires. So too early to uh, specifically predict what's going to happen in the second half of the fire season, but that's what we know is coming in the next couple of months. Just a quick synopsis on wildfire science, and Chief Winker hit most of this, but you know our area it, before Europeans settled it was prone to burn every three to five years. Of course, we've controlled that, and now we have a different type of problem, more catastrophic vegetation problem to deal, to deal with. When we're talking about wildfire, we're really concerned about two different types of fire spread, the actual flaming front and then the embers that get thrown ahead of a fire. Embers represent the largest risk to our community. 
uh, and cause up to 90% of structure ignitions. Of course, embers have to have a receptive fuel bed to ignite. That can either be a vegetative fuel bed around our homes or the homes themselves, depending on what they're constructed of. As Chief Lineker mentioned, when we we're talking about wildfire and the intensity and spread rates of wildfire, we're really focused on three things, topography, weather, and fuel. Fuel is really the only thing that we can control. And by a proper application of defensible space techniques, which is essentially removal and thinning of vegetation, and home hardening, which is altering the construction of our homes, we can make a significant impact on the likelihood that um, a home will ignite during a wildfire. What you're seeing here is a simulation of a fire pathway. The yellow lines coming out of the wildland represent fire that's running along uh, topography that's pushed by uh, wind. You can see that it's hitting the community here in, in a variety of, of locations. And what we're simulating here is uh, by, between the green and the red, that's each parcel. The green parcels have mitigation, so that's vegetation management and or home hardening. And then the, the red parcels are unmitigated um, parcels. So when we look at this, this is uh, just 9% of parcels have undertaken mitigation efforts. This next slide is 18% have taken, or 19% have undertaken mitigation efforts. And the key here, and this is what we're doing in the hills here, we're, look, we're developing similar maps. This is gonna allow us to be strategic. We know there's certain locations where fire is likely to come either from the north or the east into the city. We can focus our efforts, at least initially, in these specific areas, on these specific parcels and neighborhoods, to try to get as close to 100% mitigation as possible, we can create a barrier or a buffer that helps to, uh, will help to slow the spread of fire and allow firefighting resources to, um, to mitigate the fire and hopefully divert it around the community. So these are the types of things that are starting to emerge in terms of fire mapping and um, which are really driving our ability to be tactical with the use of our resources. So when you see us focusing in certain areas of the city, you can know that this is there's a logic behind the actions that we're taking in terms of the prioritization. A big thanks to the community for passing Measure FF. Uh, it really has been the catalyst that's allowing us to move forward with all these efforts. Uh, in in a really, as Councilmember OneGraf uh, insinuated, an incredible pace. We've been hampered by staffing over the last couple of years, recovering from the pandemic, but we have gotten an incredible amount done, and I, you'll you'll what you're going to see tonight is almost all of the programs, almost all of the people that are involved in these programs are um, made possible by Measure FF. Quickly, just to highlight, not the topic of tonight's presentation, but Measure FF also pays for a variety of other things, which are equally important that have to do with our emergency medical response, our ability to dispatch triage calls and dispatch the right resources and the um, initial and ongoing training of our personnel. So what is, how did we decide what the priorities are for our vegetation, for our wildland urban interstate based programs and um, how are we organizing all, all those projects and programs? We engaged in a community wildfire protection plan. Um, this is a, an industry standard plan that, that is exists. We have never done one before. We engaged some great local consultants uh, to help us through this process. We have done similar work with UC Berkeley and uh, almost every adjacent community to Berkeley. Essentially, this plan helped us gather input from the community, evaluate what the risks are, what the priorities for protection are in the community. And the most important piece of this document, from my perspective, is um, the action plan, which lists out the projects, programs that we're uh, undertaking to drive this uh, initiative forward. Uh, this process uh, is actually going to council or the CWPP is going to council for a presentation. It just got moved up to, uh, don't quote me here, May 16th, I believe. And so you'll get a lot more information if you want to tune into that, that special um, work session. Of course, we have not waited for the completion of the CWPP to start this work. We are already well into um, it, into working on many of the programs and projects that are called out in the CWPP. I wanna mention, uh, because it, it, 
plays into this whole story. What you see on the right on the top is the progression of the fire services fire service mission in the United States and specifically the Berkeley Fire Department mission, which is similar to most other agencies in California. Over the last 40 years, the mission has really expanded to become uh, what used to be, we used to respond to structure fires, conduct some fire prevention and respond to a small number of medicals. The number of disciplines that we're now responsible for, you know, fire department is almost a misnomer. We're an all hazards emergency response organization that uh, when people don't know what to do, they call 911 and oftentimes we're the responders that go. So I, I show this to just um, help everybody understand that things have changed significantly in our industry. A lot of this change is driven by human behavior and how society changes, impacts to healthcare. Um, and we're oftentimes experiencing different emergencies that are occurring and having to catch up. For instance, right now, we're responding to a number of um, emergency or uh, EV fires. So the small scooters are catching fire from um, the batteries are catching fire. And that's a new technology that has emerged as and presented a new threat to us. So each of these disciplines requires a, a, a number of hours every year of education, hands-on training. And this is something that we've had to kind of adapt to over the last uh, couple of decades and invest in, in our personnel and our resources, our apparatus and equipment. All this, this, this mission expansion has challenged us in terms of our facility space. Our facilities were mostly built in the 1960s. They are approaching end of life. And aside from that, we are uh, kind of busting at the seams. So the picture you see right there on the bottom right is one of our fire stations. You can see the ambulance is parked inches from the back door. And that's how all of our stations are. They're packed full. And so we have spent the last couple of years thinking, uh, working with another consultant to come up with a long-term master facilities replacement plan. Uh, it's not an emergency right now. And my goal is to uh, not get to that point. I wanna work uh, with on a long-term plan. So we, as a community, um, have an idea of what to expect and what we're gonna have, the work we're gonna have to do around these critical maintaining and replacing these critical facilities. That is also coming to council uh, special work session on the 16th um, in presentation form, if you wanna learn more about that. So let's get into it. The goal here tonight is to talk about how we protect our homes, our neighborhoods and our city and the region really. A quick review, Berkeley is broken up into three fire zones. Uh, most of the flats, so essentially west of the kind of MLK Alameda line is fire zone one. Fire zone two is everything east of that location, that, that bifurcation. And fire zone three is panoramic hills. These are escalating severity zones based on risk. And the risk has to do again with um, topography and how the weather impacts um, that area of the city. And uh, we also look at the access and egress routes. So in the fire zone, uh, which is, and I should say this defined in the fire code, adopted in the fire code, within the fire zone, there are specific concerns that, the, that we have that are based on experience within Berkeley and uh, throughout the state in, in fighting and responding to these fires and also emerging science. One of the things that is really interesting about wildfire is uh, in the last five years, Organizations like NIST, CAL FIRE, and uh, the insurance industry are really putting a lot of effort, money, uh, and time into conducting experiments. These experiments are largely validating the experience that firefighters have had on the ground for decades, but it's giving us some really interesting data that we can use to um, support new modifications and amendments to the fire code and recommendations to uh, residents. One of the things that NIST determined was the closer structures are to one another, once a structure ignites in the community, it's, it's more likely to ignite neighboring adjacent house homes if uh, those homes are closer together. NIST has three categories of density, um, low, medium, and high. And uh, most of the Berkeley Hills fall into the high density category. So that's between, homes are between six and 30 feet apart. So the GIS map you see on the right is a partial snapshot of fire zone two and three. 
And you can see the green areas represent land that is within 30 feet of a structure. The blue is within 100 feet of a structure and the red is outside of 100 feet of a structure. So most of the most homes in the city of Berkeley in fire zone two and three are within 30 feet of one another. I mentioned this earlier, but uh, most people think when a wild, wildfire comes through, the flaming front of fire is what ignites homes. That's actually not usually the case. That's kind of a uh, usually a pretty short lived um, uh, experience or uh, phenomenon. And oftentimes firefighters are able to kind of walk that fire around homes or in other ways prevent it from uh, igniting um, vegetation in homes. The majority of home ignitions are caused by embers. You can see here, this is a real picture from, um, from a fire uh, showing what, you know, what it looks like when the wind is, is really whipping up a, an ember storm ahead of a, a structure fire. And you can see the majority of, of the embers are concentrated around the perimeter of the home within the vegetation, the garden, right around the home. So embers also, aside from hitting the vegetation around the home, they can enter the home through vents that are up in the eaves, your gable vents, attic vents, roof vents, or vents uh, into the crawl space. So what we're really looking at is uh, ember, ember, ember storm can create a vegetation fire on the exterior of the home and start the exterior components of a home on fire if they're, if they're wooden or other flammable materials. Or if you have single pane windows, that uh, exterior fire can break the single pane window and then fire enters the home and can light curtains and other flammable materials inside the home on fire. This is this phenomenon, or if the embers enter the home, enter the attic, the crawl space, they can start to smolder and over the course of hours and days, they can start a fire. So these are oftentimes not um, immediate, you know, the, an ember storm's happening and your, your structure lights on fire, your home lights on fire. These can take sometimes um, hours and days to occur. But due to a lack of resources that always is the case in a large wildland fire, there's not always a fire engine crew that can be at every single house uh, every hour of the day. So small fires can grow into larger fires. And as we move through the presentation, this, this five feet around the home um, becomes a real key piece that's been now validated by science. It's kind of the, one of the two most important things we can do to protect our homes from igniting. I'm going to play this video, which is a, a short clip of an experiment, and I'll pause it a couple of times to just um, talk about what you're seeing on the screen. There's no sound to this video. So what you see here is a um, structure that's built in a lab at NIS, uh, I, at the insurance and insurance industry. And essentially what's uh, to the right of this house is a giant wall of tubes that shoot embers uh, with fans behind them. So it's simulating an ember cast that moves ahead of a wildfire. On the left side, you see the home that is not prepared for wildfire. The five feet around the home has uh, mulch, which is combustible, some vegetation, and you can see that it has wood siding, uh, wood uh, vinyl trim. Uh, and on the right side, you see a home that is prepared for wildfire. It has non-combustible gravel around the exterior and it has uh, non-combustible construction materials. So let's watch what happens. So a great short video. There's a lot of more material online on our website at, at berkeleyfire.com. You can dive into this deeper. You can read the full study, but um, the kind of cliff note, I think that summarizes the cliff notes of this really well, is we now have science that's uh, validating the things that we can do as residents to keep our homes uh, ignition resistant from wildfire. I'm going to now pass the mic to our wildfire <laughs> inspector, Duncan Allard. Thanks, Chief. Uh, great to virtually be here with all of you tonight. Um, 
Yeah, I think that video is really powerful because it, it kind of makes the case for what you see on this slide. Um, I think a lot of people think that if a, if a home survives a wildfire, they often think it may be random or it may be luck. Uh, but in most cases, it's actually not. Um, Homes that are hard, we use the word hardened, which what we mean by that is homes that have been made more resilient to wildfire, that have adequate separation between the vegetation or that have a fire resistive landscape are actually a lot more likely to survive. Or as one expert in the field said, uh, luck favors the prepared. Um, so we're encouraging people to create and maintain defensible space and to harden your home. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by defensible space. Uh, we can go on to the next slide here. Yes, yeah, so defensible space is, is actually that buffer that you create between a building on your property, whether it's your home or a garage or an ADU, and the grass, trees, and shrubs, or any wildland area that surrounds it. Um, so adequate defensible space acts as a barrier that slows or halts the progress of fire that would otherwise engulf your property and your neighbors. Again, just to be clear, 90% uh, of, of home ignition is caused by slow moving fire through flashy fuels on the ground or from the ember storm that Chief talked about and, and that you saw the video about. So the city and, and the, you know, the state of California, but the city is requiring that you maintain 100 feet of defensible space from any structure on your property uh, and that's including from structures on adjacent properties. I, I think what we need to understand is that wildfire doesn't stop at property lines. It doesn't respect property lines. And what's important to understand about this, this is this is a community effort. The work that you do on your home, that you do in your uh, on your property in your garden, is protecting not just yourself and your family, but but all the people within your community and within your neighborhood. This this is a, essentially what I'm saying. Is this is a group effort. The work that we do is going to protect ourselves and protect all of the people in the neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I think we can go on to the next slide, uh, which I guess is a video. Um, but yeah, I'll let uh, Chief play the video. Hi, I'm Duncan with the Berkeley Fire Department. Today we're going to talk about wildfire preparation and defensible space inspections. You may see Berkeley Fire Department ambassadors in the hills knocking on doors in an effort to help Berkeley residents understand defensible space and home hardening. Defensible space is the buffer you create between a building on your property and the grass, trees, shrubs, or any wildland area that surround it. It's important to understand that during a wildfire, embers are the leading cause of home ignition. The wind that blows with a wildfire pushes embers up to miles ahead of the actual fire itself. The chance of your home igniting has more to do with the embers that may fall on your property than it does with the actual direct flame contact. The things that we each do individually are going to make our homes safer, our families safer, and therefore the community around us safer. We're truly in this together. It takes each one of us to work together to make the city of Berkeley more fire safe. We divide defensible space into three zones. Zone zero, zone one, and zone two. Zone zero is directly from your structure, so zero feet to five feet from the structure. Zone one is up to 30 feet from the structure, and zone two is up to 100 feet from your structure. So in zone zero, zero to five feet, we're looking to remove all combustibles, so to clear it as much as possible. So that means no combustible bark or mulch. Hardscape like pavers, concrete, gravel, and other non-combustible mulch materials. We're also looking for you to remove all dead and dying weeds, grass, plants, shrubs, leaves, needles, cones, and to check your roofs and gutters, decks and porches and stairways. We're also looking for you to remove all branches within 10 feet of any chimney or stovepipe outlet. Remove flammable plants near windows, including climbing vines on exterior walls. Limit plants in this area to low-growing, non-woody, properly maintained plants. Consider relocating garbage and recycling containers outside of Zone Zero. When you're assessing your own home, make sure to look and see if there's any dead or dying vines that connect the vegetation on the ground to the eaves or to your roof. We're trying to eliminate anything that might be a ladder from dead or dying vegetation to your home. 
Wooden fences are common in Berkeley. We're actually recommending now that people use metal fences if possible, or at least the part that actually attaches to the house. Again, planters are common in Berkeley. What we're recommending is that people either use steel planters or ceramic planters, whatever is non-combustible. So zone one we call our lean, clean, and green zone. In zone one, it's okay to have a beautiful garden. But what we're asking people to do is to make sure that the garden they do have is lean and green and that they remove any of the dead and dying vegetation. Relocate wood piles to zone two, which is beyond 30 feet up to 100 feet. Remove vegetation and items that could catch fire from around and under decks, balconies, and stairs. Trim trees regularly to keep branches a minimum of 10 feet from other trees. Create a separation between trees, shrubs, and items that could catch fire, like patio furniture, wood piles, swing sets, etc. So when we talk about defensible space, you'll often hear us talk about vertical space or ladder fuels. What we're talking about there is removing vegetation that can connect from the ground to the trees. One thing you can do is limb your trees up to six feet from the ground, cutting or mowing annual grass down to a maximum height of four inches, creating horizontal space between shrubs and trees, and you can remove any plants or vegetation that might connect the ground to those trees to your home. So for many of our residents in Berkeley, there may not appear to be a zone two, as zone two extends from 30 feet to 100 feet from the home. Larger estates will have a zone two, but also keep in mind that zone two on smaller properties will still extend 100 feet from the home regardless of city streets and adjacent properties. So what we're looking for in zone two, if you have one, is to do as much fuel reduction as you can. Again, trying to keep your plants and your trees lean and green and removing all dead and dying vegetation all exposed wood piles must have a minimum of 10 feet of clearance down to bare mineral soil in all directions. It's really important to understand that this is a community effort. Every single one of us has to participate in this in order for the entire city to be safe. If you have any questions or need to learn more about the Wildland Urban Interface Program, please visit berkeleyfire.com slash firesafe. All right, I haven't seen that in a while. Um, but hopefully that hopefully that uh, lays out the the different zones. You, you'll you'll hopefully see me out in the neighborhoods and and some other inspectors um, to to discuss this with you in person if you need. And 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 the hope is that we'll be able to explain it to you specifically about your own home. Um, so, Chief, do you want to go through this slide? Briefly, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to pop on, just talk about the fire code briefly and then pass it back to Duncan. So the fire code uh, is where all these regulations live and uh, it's adopted every three years. Fire code is uh, at minimum, we have to adopt what the state adopts and there's local amendments uh, that we adopt based on uh, specific local conditions. So essentially all those um, zones that uh, Duncan was talking about are um, regulated by the state. Zone zero is in effect for any new uh, houses, new construction that came into effect in January of 2023. We're expecting zone zero for all uh, existing property, existing structures to come into effect in January of 24. Although there's um, some, you know, there's some degree of debate and controversy because of um, people's reluctance to, you know, take take those types of measures. We know that science says zone zero is, it should extend to five feet around the, the home and that that's the best way to reduce um, ignition of the home. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, I wanna also point out one amendment that we made to the fire code to clarify, uh, and Duncan talked about it is, fire does not respect boundaries, property lines, city lines, county lines. So. Um, we all have an individual responsibility to measure out from our homes and if, uh, we hit our fence line at, at 30 feet uh, or less, we really should look into our neighbor's yards. And if there's a home that and your property is within five feet, 30 feet or 100 feet, you should be applying those vegetation management practices and treatments to your property based on your neighbor's, the proximity of your neighbor's home. Um, hopefully I explained that clearly, but uh, when we, you know, when we, again, when we experience wild fires, it's just going to keep going unless we interrupt the, the fuel uh, that, that's feeding it. 
All right, back to you, Duncan. All right, I will keep going. Duncan, chime in if. Um... Sorry, I was on mute. Let me, uh, let me hit that again. I um, just want to pick this up and talk a little bit and explain about hardening homes. Um, it's again, it's I, I'll keep reiterating this and I'll, I'll be talking to you all about this out in the field, but homes are most often lost to or and, and are ignited by embers or small, low intensity fires. I think we have this idea that it's this wall of flame where these exploding trees and that while those are those conditions occur, the, the actual home ignition is caused from the embers and the low intensity fires. So one of the in addition to addressing your own vegetation and, and the plants that are in your that are in your uh, gardens, we're really trying to help people understand what this concept of hardening our homes are. And um, there's actually some really simple ways and, and actually inexpensive ways. I think uh, I've, I've been, a lot of concerns I've heard when doing inspections and talking to people about this in the field is that it's such an expensive um, thing to change, you know, to, to get double paned windows or to change the wood shingles on the house. But it turns out that some of the easiest ways to harden the home are to put less than an eighth inch wire mesh behind vents to get gutter, uh, gutter covers put over um, the, uh, any gutters that we have and clearing combustible materials under a deck or within five feet of a structure. So things like double pane windows are, are a big ask. It's, it's definitely helpful, but if, if you keep vegetation away from your windows, uh, that's, that's a less important uh, change that you need to make. And, and in reality, the, the simple things, the, vent, the vents uh, with the mesh can actually save your home. It's, I, I think Chief mentioned this before, but it's the attics and the crawl spaces where embers can get in and really can really wreak havoc. And that's an actually a really inexpensive an inexpensive shift. So we're, we're trying to, uh, one of the big focuses with the inspections that we'll be doing and, and with the ambassadors that we'll be sending out and the information that's available on the berkeleyfire.com website is to really explain some of these concepts so that it's uh, an attainable to all of you, all of you homeowners out there, and things that you know that you can do to prepare your homes from wildfire. Again, um, the, the the idea that the fire department's going to be able to get to every single home in the event of a wildfire is um, a big ask, and it's going to be the preparation that will most likely make the difference that will save your home or not. So this slide here uh, is an example of sort of a before and after uh, a home that has some some issues within zone zero has some both some vegetation issues and some home hardening um, so you can kind of see and in, in the before picture there is Italian cypress and and some some plants within that zero to five that zone zero uh, that zone zero that we were talking about and then what they've done in the after picture is they've removed those those plants and replace them with pavers, with gravel. And again, the enormous amount of science over the last couple of decades proves that this is a, this, this simple change, uh, taking that vegetation out and replacing it with non-combustible material, in, it makes an incredible difference to protecting the home that you see here. Um, I, I, what I often tell people when they're, if you look at your house and think about a, a campfire, uh, if there's anything around it that looks like kindling, dead or dying matter, uh, anything that would be the cause of a simple ignition from embers, that's where you want to focus your energy. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the community support programs that we'll be working on, that we have been working on and that, and that we've got coming to you guys. Um, there's an amazing amount of education and outreach that's happening. We're going to be targeting high-risk parcels, and with the Measure FF money that you got that has been brought to us, which we're able to use now, uh, one of one of the big changes we've been able to make are interactive inspection reports. So some of you may have already experienced this, um, but when we come out, you'll be able to have a report that you can view online that has photographs, comments, and specific information about 
the uh, issues that your home is experiencing. So we'll be giving you information about defensible space. We'll be giving you information about home hardening. Um, before I explain too much about the, the defensible space inspection and DSI reports, just you'll also see ambassadors. We'll be doing ambassador outreach. There's a chipper program that you'll hear Chief talk about. And we're working on a pilot uh, resident assistance program. So we have a lot of, we also have the Firewise Neighborhood Coaching that many of you are already participating in. Um, so yeah, so these defensible space inspections should look, uh, hopefully you have one or you will get one soon. Um, and basically it's a, it's a really easy way for you to understand an evaluation of your property. And it gives you a roadmap to making your property more fire safe will speak specifically to issues that you experience in zone zeros to, and, and two, probably not zone three because most of the homes don't have that. And what you'll get is a door hanger that uh, has a, a, a property specific code on it uh, and a website where once you go to that website, you can access your specific inspection report for your home. Um, so I think we can go on. So, I think the, the biggest thing to understand when you receive these reports, and I, and I actually get a lot of questions about this, some of what you receive are going to be what we determine as violations, right? And those are going to be specifically for vegetation management issues. So it's important that if you see something that's a violation, that that's something that you need to address uh, within approximately 30 days. Um, and when we'll come out and we'll do a reassessment, uh, uh, reinspection, and those are required. So if we, if you see on your report something that's listed as a violation, that means that it's required to be addressed within approximately 30 days. And you'll see us again because we'll come out to see how how that work is going. You're also going to see on your report recommendations. And I, again, I want to make this very clear. The home hardening issues that we that we put in these reports are recommendations. They are not, as of yet, required by by law or by the city, um, but we strongly recommend them. I think again, um, understanding that homes are actually the biggest fuel in the hills, with the with the the driest and the most abundant fuel. It's important to do your best to make your home resilient to the ember storm or to the slow moving fire that may that may occur. But those at this point are only recommendations. They're not required. So if you receive a report that says, hey, you've got single pane windows and we recommend that you get double pane tempered windows, that is not a requirement. We're not requiring that within 30 days you go out and spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to replace your windows. It's a recommendation to make your home more resilient. Something that you'll also see in the reports is reinforcement. Um, again, you're, you're gonna, it's a, I mean, it's quite literally a 15 to 18 page report. And a lot of what's in there is uh, an assessment on our part saying that, it, you know, this is a really resilient finding that we found. You have, you have metal gutters, you have uh, double pane tempered windows, your, your house has, uh, is, has stucco, it has an asphalt roof. Those are, that's us, that's an attempt for us to help educate everybody as to what makes a home more resilient. So there's a difference between violations and recommendations and the reinforcement that you'll see. Um, the last thing that you'll see on these reports is uh, an opportunity for you to correct. Um, it, you don't, we don't necessarily need to come all the way out to see that you've made that change. Uh, for instance, if you receive a violation that says grass needs to be less than four inches, which as we all know with all these rains, so, so much vegetation is growing. Um, if you see that violation, and it, you'll see an opportunity for you to correct it simply by taking a picture that lets us know that that's been corrected and then we can go into the system and without even coming back out, we can correct it for you. So we're trying to make this as interactive and as easy for you, the homeowner, to understand and to be able to get the information and make your homes more resilient. Um, everything that we put as a violation, we, we're, we're always going to provide reasonable options for correcting it. And that, that last bit there is an opportunity for you to communicate with us and let us know that, that that's been corrected. So um, I think at this point, Chief, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Duncan. 
I want to talk about a couple other programs that we're working on or have already rolled out that support um, our efforts to, uh, at the parcel level, create defensible space. The first is uh, the fire fuel surcharge used to pay for a chipping program that would come through the hills twice a year on specific dates to each neighborhood and pick up um, pick up vegetation. We've now uh, modernized that and it's moved under parks from under parks, recs and waterfront to the fire department. We've hired professional full-time contractors to run that service. And we've uh, deployed a new user-friendly self-schedule website. So you can now go on to berkeleyfire.com, navigate to um, the chipping program website and make an appointment. Um, there's appointments that um, are available uh, every um, for the next 16 weeks. And um, we've also expanded this citywide. The funding source is now also Measure FF, which frees up the fire fuel surcharge funding to continue to pay for the green bin program. And we're also evaluating um, what other specific enhancements are required in the fire zone that that funding can be used for. A couple of stats on the chipping program that are pretty exciting, I think. We're four weeks in, 135 pickups, over 300 cubic yards, an average of 2.4 cubic yards per pickup. We've got 16 remaining weeks and we've got 48 reservations next week. Um, we do an after pickup survey and um, we're still getting uh, the highest rating, 5.0 rating, uh, one out of five. And this is just one comment that's indicative of what we're seeing, uh, just that the program is easier to use. I can schedule pickup based on when I'm removing vegetation instead of the other way around. And um, the crews are really professional and leave, uh, leave it um, the area spotless. The other program we're working on, again, this will be targeted initially, at least based on those fire pathway maps and where we know fire is going to hit the community if it comes out of the park or out of um, uh, Kensington, El Cerrito. We're going to be um, rolling out a resident assistance program. So there'll be a financial, financial, um, um, there'll be funds available to help residents either uh, direct with direct work through a city contractor or reimbursement to perform vegetation management on their property. This will be one-time funds available to help bring properties into compliance that are really out of compliance. And it'll be targeted at uh, residents that are either uh, financially or physically um, struggling to perform the work. Uh, that is a pilot program that we've adopted from other communities like uh, around us that are experimenting with this. And we've also applied for a grant to uh, significantly expand that program uh, depending on the results of the pilot program. What are we doing on the home hardening front? A lot of this is education. Um, uh, and you can find a bunch of curated information on defensible space, on home hardening on our website, berkeleyfire.com. Because uh, part of the challenge is there's so much information out there. And uh, we spent the last eight months kind of sifting through it, curating it. So you can see what we think is the most valuable information on the, the main part of the web page. If you scroll to the bottom of any of the pages on that website, you'll see a dig deeper or dive deeper section with all kinds of the backup material, full reports, videos, uh, if you wanna really uh, get into it, into the nitty gritty. So aside from education and the call outs, the recommendations in the defensible space inspections, we're also piloting a program that um, was super successful in Chief Winokur's jurisdiction, where we're gonna provide um, residents, again, up in, a, in a pilot area to start with the mesh to cover your gutters or screen your vents to your home. Um, this will be rolling out in the next uh, month or so in a pilot area, and depending on, on how it goes, we will tweak it and roll it out to a larger part of the community. All these, of course, funded by Measure FF. As I mentioned, education and outreach are really key. So we're dumping a lot of resources into designing um, how we communicate with the community. We have brought on a public information officer who is in large part focused on all our messaging around wildfire um, and helping us just have a consistent and kind of uh, message, message campaign to the community. As was mentioned by Councilmember Wengraf, uh, Firewise coaching or Firewise becoming a Firewise neighborhood is a strong recommendation that we make. You know, a lot of um, look at what we did with the CERT program and how successful that's been in transforming our behaviors and just 
becoming more aware of how to be uh, ready for a disaster before it happens. We just need to adopt the same mindset um, with a little more focus on wildfire. Uh, the FireWise program is a National Fire Protection Association, NFPA program that essentially has a framework that guides neighbors on how to work together to organize and reduce their fire risk, both on the parcel level and at the neighborhood level. There's grants available once you become a FireWise community. And we have a coach, one of our retired battalion chiefs, Kevin Revilla, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet who has come back to help us um, uh, interface with the communities. It's, it's a, um, there is a process to apply to NFPA to become a FireWise group, and we have um, him as a resource to help folks through that process. The other thing we're doing is, um, this is, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, we got to work together to do this. This is really about neighbors helping neighbors. And uh, in that vein, we rolled out a wildland urban interface ambassador program. You can uh, apply on our website, again, at berkeleyfire.com, search for the volunteer tab. What we're looking for is, is neighbors to come get some real basic training uh, and then to hit the streets in the fire zone two and three and knock on doors, make face-to-face -face contact with folks and just let them know uh, what's going on, what the risk is and what uh, where they can go to get more information. And finally, of course, uh, I referenced the website a bunch of times. Uh, we're doing direct mail, uh, both uh, to the fire zones, but also citywide. Um, we are going to be much more active on social media. Uh, you'll, you've probably seen more emails from us on the topic, and we're out in the communities at farmers markets and other community events, uh, just a much elevated presence uh, than you've seen before. And that's all thanks to Measure FF. I am now going to turn the mic over to Sarah Lana, manager of our Office of Emergency Services. Thank you, Chief. So, so far, we've been talking about programs to help protect your property. And now we want to talk about your safety as a person. So our department has really evolved its thinking about evacuation over the last five years. And I'm going to go through the programs that we have to support you getting out of harm's way. Next slide, please. So Safe Passages is an umbrella program that covers the city's work to increase roadway capacity for emergencies, not only for just evacuees, but also for responders to get into the heart of an emergency that occurs. And there are several focuses in this program. One is roadway treatments that increase the throughput for evacuees or responders. Another is vegetation management alongside these roadways. And it's not only to ensure that the roadways are as clear as possible, but also if you look at these photos on the right, in a fire scenario, all of the vegetation in this top picture will burn. And if that happens, this will not be an evacuation route. So, Vegetation management is also a critical element of this program. And then the third is parking enforcement for existing red curb and no parking areas. And there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle and this work is a partnership really that involves fire and public works, works and police in addition. And these projects were definitely slowed down by the pandemic. Right now, we're refocusing in a few areas. Um, all the red curbs and no parking signs that are in fire zones two and three are being refreshed. We've already finished the panoramic hill area. And during periods of fire weather, which we will discuss in a minute, uh, the police department is adding specific patrols to the hills to perform parking enforcement and to do that to make sure that roadways are as clear as possible should an evacuation become necessary. We're also looking at roadway treatment. So with Measure FF, we're able to step back and actually look at our roadway network from a citywide perspective instead of doing you know, site by site assessment. So we could, for example, fix a hairpin turn that's high in the hills, but it won't do any good if vehicles get through that and then are backed up, you know, halfway up Marin because of a blockage at the Marin Circle. So what we know we need to do is look at the roadway system in whole to make really strategic application of our time and of our funding. 
So in support of that, an evacuation time study with a contractor. And what they're going to do is start by making a baseline model of traffic throughout Berkeley. And then from there, we're going to overlay different fire scenarios to understand how long is it going to take us to evacuate people out of harm's way, and then at the same time to get our responders in from each of Berkeley's seven fire stations, as well as from stations outside our border, because we know it's going to be a team effort with all of our partners anytime we have a fire. Now, this study is also not just engineering based. It's not just how fast can the um, car go through the roadway, but it's also considering the human behavior element. With We're going to have phone interviews to understand, for example, how many cars people are planning to take when they evacuate, because this is all going to translate to what our roadways uh, can hold. So when this study is done, we're going to be able to develop a really comprehensive strategy for roadway treatment that's actually backed by science. And we're really excited to get this moving. Um, this, this work is also going to help the city to comply with new legislation uh, that's related to evacuation. SB 99 requires that we identify all developments in Berkeley that have one way in and one way out. AB 747 is about identifying evacuation routes and how they will perform under different emergency scenarios. And then AB 1409 requires us to identify evacuation borders. Uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, evacuation locations. So we're going to be pulling all of in this information um, out through this evacuation time study. Um, so safe passages, big picture, is structured to address evacuation out of the path of a fire. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, like I mentioned, we've really undergone a complete paradigm shift on the way that we look at fire evacuation. So these catastrophic fires that we are seeing, they are weather phenomena. They are just like hurricanes, just like tornadoes. And we can predict the weather conditions that are going to create the greatest danger here in Berkeley. So what this table shows us is two of the really key factors in fire weather. First one is on the y-axis, it's humidity. The lower the humidity, the drier it is, faster a fire is gonna spread. The other factor here is wind speed. Faster winds are gonna push a fire more quickly. Um, not just, uh, as the chiefs were saying, the fire front, but especially those embers that we've been discussing. Now, the National Weather Service, they're monitoring all of this, and they issue red flag warnings when conditions are especially dry and windy, and that's what you can see kind of in that color gradient. But what we noticed a few years ago is we wanted to take this a step further and understand the hazard specifically to Berkeley. What we noticed was that these really catastrophic fires were happening under extremely windy, extremely dry conditions. So we in the Berkeley Fire Department termed those conditions extreme fire weather. And our team is constantly monitoring the weather. And when the Berkeley Fire Department declares an extreme fire weather day, what we're saying is that the safest place for you to be is out of the hills. Because when that fire starts, the only thing that is going to be able to stop it is when the winds die down. We have experience from this in our history that the chiefs have referenced. And we're really trying to take heart um, with what we've learned from the past. So part of our charge to you in fire evacuation is to consider what you can do now to make it easier and smoother to temporarily move out of your household, out of the hills, and out of harm's way during these very specific and very predictable conditions. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so when we look at them, you can see that since 2020, we have had a total of 41 days in red flag warning status. And we've only had to declare extreme fire weather warnings on two days since 2020. So as a reminder, our recommendations to you are in red flag warning, we need you to leave your phone on. It's really important. I just wanna pause here for a second and highlight. 
do not turn on that do not disturb function. It's a double negative, but it's critically important that if we have fire weather, you don't activate your do not disturb function on your phone. Reason being that all of our emergency alerting systems, they are very powerful. We'll talk about them in a second. They cannot get through to your phone if your do not disturb function is set to on. So if we are announcing that there's a red flag warning or extreme fire weather, we need you for that day, for that night, to keep the do not disturb function set off so that you can receive alerts from us should a fire occur. Secondly, if we're talking about a red flag warning, we want you to be ready to evacuate should a fire occur. So what that looks like is knowing your evacuation zone, which is going to be used for evacuation messages. We want you to have your go bag by the front door. And we want you to know the evacuation routes that you might use uh, if you are called on to evacuate, including two that are by foot. What we've seen from our past fire experiences is that cars are going to back up and we don't want you to be waiting and sitting in your car for traffic to die down. You need to know how you're going to get out by foot as well. Uh, third, we want you to park off the street. Go ahead and back your car into your driveway, back in into your garage, and do your best to leave those streets clear for emergency vehicles. So that's all for red flag warning. And for extreme fire weather, as we said, the fire department recommends that the most important thing you can do to try to stay safe is to stay out of the Berkeley Hills. And at the same time, under these circumstances, we want you to keep your vehicles off the street if you have multiple vehicles to make sure that those roadways are as open as possible for responders to get through. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So we used to issue, uh, sorry, we used to recommend that everyone have an evacuation plan. But as part of our evolution, we've really changed our framing on this. Now we recommend that everyone have a household fire weather plan. We've created a tool to walk you through the key decisions that your household will need to make. When will you leave? Where will you go? What routes will you take? And you can use this tool to make a plan that is tailored to your people and your animals considering everyone's abilities and also your personal risk tolerance. We have uh, as well wildfire readiness videos that get into a lot more detail about the steps that you should take to re-ready. And additionally, we recognize that we can learn a lot from our fellow community members because we're going through the same experience together, planning to be ready. And so we, as our office, want to encourage these conversations. So we're offering workshops that you can come together and join a group discussion to talk about what you're planning to do if there is extreme fire weather. And we're going to offer our next one uh, online uh, as a citywide workshop open to anybody on Wednesday, July 19th. We'll have uh, additional information at the end of this about how to sign up. Um, in addition to that, uh, now that we're actually in a new phase of COVID, we can come to facilitate the same discussion in your neighborhood or at a place of your choosing if you can gather 10 households for that meeting. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So one of the most important steps in evacuation is knowing where to get information. When I got here 12 years ago, we had two systems. We had BENS, which is the Berkeley Emergency Notification System, and 1610 AM radio. And since then, the alerting landscape nationwide has really changed and really grown. And now we have a lot more and better technology to get information to you where you are. So our primary tool now is AC Alert. When we have fire weather or a fire evacuation, we will use a lot of systems to share that information with you. But AC Alert is still the most powerful. If you have an AT&T landline in Berkeley, then we have your number automatically. But since you might not have a landline phone um, and you might not always be home next to your phone, what we need is for you to sign up online to get your cell phone and any email addresses associated with an AC alert account so that we can reach you in an emergency. 
Uh, we can, through the system, send text messages, voice messages, TTY and TDD messages, and also emails. And you can sign up at acalert.org. So the second uh, system that I wanna highlight is wireless emergency alerts. We can send really short text messages to mobile phones based on their real-time location. So when these messages come in, they have these really distinct and kind of awful tones that definitely get your attention. You've probably gotten them uh, for, from the CHP for like an Amber Alert for missing children. Um, now in the case of fire evacuation, all of these different um, alerts and systems are going to be pointing you to our online evacuation maps to get more information. So this map is available at community.zonehaven.com and it's updated, like I said, in real time. It breaks Berkeley and all of California into numbered zones. So when we do a fire evacuation, it's gonna be based on those zones. And right now, what we want you to do is bookmark that website so that if there's something happening, you can track it in real time. And we also have a slew of other systems that are a lot less targeted and less able to kind of interrupt your day-to-day -day life, uh, but that we may use if we're having problems with these first three. And so they are 1610 AM radio, which a lot of you are familiar with, uh, the emergency alert system, that's the one that has TV and radio interrupts, social media, we also have the city's new website. So these are systems that we want you to be familiar with, but are not going to be our primary tools. Now I'm going to transition it uh, over to Chief May to discuss another tool that we will soon have in our toolbox. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, um, so we transition now to a different type of alerting system, and I'll give you a little bit of history on that, but it's called the Outdoor Warning System. Uh, a little bit of history, back in 2004, the then Disaster Fire and Safety Commission sent a report to council asking for some type of outdoor warning system, and at the time, the, the technology really was just sirens, um, and there was some that was out there that had voice capability. Um, and it was came back as really not recommended for Berkeley at the time. Fast forward 2019, the Disaster Fire and Safety Commission uh, sent another report to council expressing the need for this outdoor warning system. Since 2004, a lot of technology has advanced and this item, um, our office, Office of Emergency Services took a look at and really came up with the uh, recommendation that I think this system is something that we could benefit or the community could benefit um, and we could add it to our uh, toolbox of alerting. So the system has the ability uh, to broadcast pre-recorded or live messages about threats that are posed by fire or tsunamis or uh, other life-threatening emergencies. Um, and the voice messages are accompanied by a very slow wail tone. And we have actually a, a sound bite that you can kind of hear what that's going to sound like. So if you could hit that sound bite. Attention, there is a fire in the area. Evacuations are underway. You might be in danger. Check your phone, turn on your TV or radio, and look for more information. Attention, there is a fire in the area. Evacuations are underway. You might be in danger. Check your phone, turn on your TV or radio, and look for more information. Okay, we didn't play the entire thing, but you can kind of get an idea of what that will sound like. And this sound can be heard well over half a mile away, depending on obstructions, um, topography. So we are installing, at this point, a total of 15 of these systems throughout the city. Uh, we divided it up into two phases. Uh, the first phase uh, we put out in five different locations. Thank you. And those, those locations, 
Um, we have as uh, fire station number seven up in the hills. Also in the hills, Zaytuna College, which is kind of on the north end of the hills. Uh, we have one already installed also at City Hall, uh, the Animal Care uh, Services Building on the West End, and then also the Harbors Master's Office uh, down by the marina. Phase two will be, um, uh, we're already in the permitting phase of that, uh, not with the City of Berkeley, but with the State Department of Architecture, because they uh, will be going on a lot of the uh, Berkeley Unified School District buildings, and so that's a separate uh, permitting agencies for getting you know permits for that. Uh, so we are hopeful that by 2024 or in 2024, the entire systems will be up and running. Um, and we are in the next couple of months campaigning and um, planning a demo day for the community so they can um, start to see what this will help and it'll help us get the message out to you. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Chief. Thank you, Keith. So wrapping up the presentation here, this is a photo of the 1923 fire looking from uh, downtown up into the hills. And I just want to recognize that um, we've done an incredible amount of work as a community. Uh, in the last 30 years, that's included passing three different uh, measures, uh, bond measure, measure Q, and then two parcel tax measures, GG and FF. Measure Q allowed us to um, seismically retrofit all our critical facilities, install generators so that um, we're still able to get out of the fire stations when after an earthquake and um, we have backup power, which has become a lot more handy since the PSPS events. GG has allowed us to expand CERT, um, it provided funding to stop fire station closures and it funded also our ability to join the regional communication system which was highlighted as a significant issue after the 91 Hills fire. And of course, Measure FF, which is just um, really allowing us to take off in a variety of different initiatives to support the community. Um, we're establishing firewise neighborhoods. We've got actually a uh, fire safe council going. Um, these are great community uh, driven initiatives that are gonna um, yield uh, incredible dividends over the next coming years. Um, uh, also, uh, if you're not aware, PG&E um, is has installed a quick alert detection network, so cameras that are looking into essentially all areas where they have PG&E transmission lines. Uh, they have uh, AI detection technology, so we have access to those, and um, the idea is that they quickly get alerted to a small incipient fire, uh, so we can um, take uh, initial attack resources. We also got uh, Measure Q, which helped fund the above ground water delivery system. And we know that our East Bay mud infrastructure is old and will in a seismic event uh, not survive. So we've got the above ground system. We've also purchased a, a large uh, mobile uh, water tanker um, that we can keep filled with 3000 gallons of water to help us make quick attack in the event of uh, infrastructure failure or if we have a wildland fire in the park. Um, adjacent to us, which uh, we would respond to. Of course, the outdoor warning system. Um, what's next for us uh, on the immediate agenda, as you have kind of heard tonight, the evacuation study and really being strategic or tactical with uh, where we're making um, modifications to our road network, looking at future development in the hills, increasing density. What does that actually look like um, in looking at a couple different scenarios? Uh, that'll be part of the evacuation time study, and that information is going to allow us to make some uh, better, uh, more informed decisions on on um, on that type of zoning and density. And of course, we're working with our partners in East Bay Regional Park Districts and the Moraga Rinda Fire District to um, ensure that we have buffers, fuel breaks, and vegetation thinning in the parklands as that is the most likely place that a, uh, a, a fire of this magnitude is gonna, gonna hit us. Um, we're mostly concerned about fires coming out of the adjacent parklands into the community. Um, you know, when fires start inside the city, we get alerted really quickly and, um, and we're, we're, we respond pretty, pretty fast. So, I, you know, for a fire to start and really cause a huge problem in the community, the most likely place that's going to occur is going to start in the, in the parklands. It's going to develop speed um, 
as it approaches the city and then um, and then hit the community. So next steps that uh, we're asking you to take is um, when you get your inspection, um, log in, review that inspection report. Remember violations uh, we need you to take care of. That's required in the fire code. Recommendations are voluntary based on best practice from all the science that is now validating uh, what we can do to keep our homes fire safe. If you're doing space, defensible space work, schedule an appointment with the CHIPPER program. Please use it. Um, it's uh, a great service. It's available citywide. Make sure that uh, you have a plan to uh, implement home hardening. Um, like we said, there are, of course, expensive things that need to happen, like um, getting rid of Class A roofs. There's a couple left in the community uh, or replacing your windows with double pane windows. But some of the most effective actions you can take are both inexpensive and can be DIY. And those are um, putting the screening over your gutters and behind any vents that enter your home. Please sign up for AC alert, bookmark community.zonehaven.com, which is our evacuation map planning tool. Create your evacuation or your uh, fire weather plan. And of course, sign up for alerts, uh, an alert workshop, uh, which is uh, coming up via Zoom in July. We've got a resource guide for you here, all of the different resources we talked about, uh, different email addresses for different divisions, and a quick QR code since everybody loves QR codes now. We had to put one in the slideshow somewhere. Um, that gets us to berkeleyfire.com. Again, the curated website dedicated to everything wildfire. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I uh, hope you're as excited as I am by all this um, all these programs and projects and people that are now on the job to help. This is all thanks to your support in passing Measure FF um, and looking forward to meeting with many of you over the coming years and um, engaging in this really important work. Thank you, Council Member Wengraf, for your time tonight and organizing this presentation, and I will turn it back to you. Well, thank you, uh, Chief Sprague. I wish I had a recording of applause uh, that you could hear because this was really, yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> this was really a uh, an incredible uh, a presentation, so informative. And um, I know that uh, I'm sure that everybody in the audience is extremely appreciative. So we have a little bit of time for questions now. And um, if, we, if we don't have enough time to answer all of your questions, um, I encourage you to uh, write your questions down and mail them to me, and um, I will make sure that they get answered. So this is the way we're gonna do it. At the bottom of your screen, um, there's a raised hand icon. It's a little hand that looks like this. If you don't see it, um, there's a button that says reactions. You can click on the reactions and that should show you the, the hand. Um, if you click on the raised hand icon, my assistant Lori will call your name and in the order that, that she sees your hand and she will unmute you um, or allow you to unmute so that you can ask your question verbally. So, um, Again, thank you to all of you. Fantastic job, really great program. Um, Laurie, do you see any hands raised? Yes, the first speaker is Todd Andrew. Okay, Todd, you should be able to ask your question. Thank you, Council Member Wengraf, and um, thank you so much to everyone from Berkeley Fire. Uh, it was so informative and comprehensive, um, and I just want to congratulate Chief Sprague. Um, I was really touched um, by what transpired on Tuesday uh, with your family in the audience and your history in Berkeley, and I just want to say how comfortable I feel with you in charge of our fire department and uh, Jen Lewis in charge of our uh, police, our first responders, and our really premier first responder agencies in this city. But um, I just, to get to my questions, um, I was wondering, um, are there enforcement mechanisms, given that we know how important it is that 
uh, fire be contained with the embers and everything that you've said is so important uh, to containing a fire. Um, are there enforcement mechanisms um, that are in place with regard to the defensible space uh, requirements that result from the inspections? That's my first question. And also, I was wondering if there is any effort afoot uh, or any plan in place to deal with the eucalyptus, which can also be really important on controlling the embers. Thank you again so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate uh, your comments and, and tuning in the other night. Uh, yeah, two great questions. Um, our enforcement capability has severely uh, or could be severely improved. And um, to be uh, quite transparent, we are um, on an analog paper-based citation system. And the amount of time that it takes to process citation is uh, has, has been, it's inhibited our ability to enforce in the past. About six months ago, we undertook an, a, an effort to modernize that process. And we've got a contract that's going to council uh, later this month um, that will digitize the entire process um, and also give us additional resources um, to make the process easier for both inspectors and the community to access. Um, it will give us more access to hearing officers. And we're anticipating that this will um, really allow us when necessary to engage in the enforcement process. Of course, the, uh, the asterisk to that is that is the last resort. We want to be an education-based uh, organization when it comes to this. And we think that um, through one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, if we're able to have those with residents, we can usually gain voluntary compliance. But we know that's not always going to be the case, and we will have that tool available coming into um, the second half of the fire season. Uh, eucalyptus is uh, an issue. It is a species that does present a higher fire risk than some other, other species. There are other species that are also issues, issues juniper uh, being one of them that's very prevalent. And uh, the, the, of course, we recommend that residents um, thin and remove vegetation and trees based on the recommendations that we leave in the defensible space in for, uh, inspections. When it comes to kind of a citywide mitigation effort, um, it is not going to be a short term. There's not a short term solution or fix to that for the primary reason that um, as soon as we spend a dollar of public money um, cutting down any type of tree, that requires a CEQA. Uh, and once we file a CEQA, we will uh, be likely engaged in a lawsuit, uh, which you've seen happen in the uh, parks and Claremont Conservancy, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, the, uh, help me out, Susan, the, what was the other one? Claremont Canyon. Um, so uh, it is definitely on our radar. We are hyper-focused, firing on all 10 cylinders on all the work we've been doing. Uh, we've had lots of conversations with um, about this issue with a variety of stakeholders, and it, it's a long-term thing we're likely going to have to address, but um there's no short-term immediate fix for for that issue okay the next person is candace hyde wang hi candace hi so um i've been working with the league of women voters on wildfire and urban wildfire and the thing that concerns me is that the volume of evacuation that would have to take place. We've got tens of thousands of cars in my thinking coming not just from the Berkeley Hills and the lower hills, but Kensington and all down Alameda, Marin, Spruce and Euclid. That's So are we still going to do these preemptive evacuations? Are you gonna uh, uh, ask people to leave a couple of days early? Great There's no other way, is there? Yeah, great question, Sarah. Do you wanna field that one? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, what we were talking about is that these fires that are going to get out of control and require really massive areas of the city to evacuate, like you're describing, uh -huh. are the ones that are associated with that extreme fire weather. Right. So it doesn't happen very often, right? That, that's mm -hmm. at least right now. <laughs> uh, counter lucky stars for it. But we, 
I do track that whether and when we get the report back specifically showing that Berkeley is expecting that weather, that's when we issue the extreme fire weather warning and recommend to community members that the safest place seems to be out of the hills for exactly the circumstances that you uh, described. You know, we're, we're really interested to see what is going to come out of that evacuation time study, but we also expect that it's going to validate exactly the concerns that, um, that you're raising here. Sarah, could you also touch on the idea with Zone Haven and kind of the um, triage, not triage, sequenced evacu evacuation? Sure. Yeah. So, so we also mentioned the zone haven evacuation zones. You can see behind Chief May and behind uh, we uh, are very invested in these zones. But the idea again is that we're uh, we've learned over time that we need to break Berkeley up into specific zones that we can quickly communicate to community members um, in the case of a fire, as well as to each other. And one thing that we might expect to come out of the evacuation time study might be, again, lots of caveats here, but uh, a recommendation that the way that we approach evacuation to be sequenced based on the um, the time that a fire might have arrived in a particular zone of Berkeley. So in addition to just getting a general understanding of how long it's going to take to evacuate um, a, an area under threat, we're also going to understand whether um, strategically and tactically, it makes sense for us to try to evacuate different swaths of um, areas under threat first uh, for, or, or in a sequential order. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. Hi, Anna. Look, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, Anna, can you uh, press the, um, the, the microphone at the little, there you go. Okay. Hi. I, I didn't actually have a question. No. Oh. All right. Well, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Is there another hand up? There is another hand up. Um, oh, wow. Okay. There's a, oh, there's a few more hands up. We don't want to have too many hands, I think. Um, uh, but the next person is Carol Morasovic. Okay. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Um, Thanks. Hi. Thanks, Council Member uh, Wengriff and Chief Sprague and the Berkeley Fire Department uh, here for this excellent presentation. Um, I'm deeply concerned with all the development downtown that we're going to have uh, thousands of new residents in Berkeley. And our we planning for these evacuation, new evacuation routes. I'm concerned that there won't be adequate uh, room to evacuate in a fire or another uh, disaster. Uh, that's my primary question. I also want to ask if it was accurate that every fire station does not have an ambulance attached to it and what would be needed for an ambulance to be uh, uh, financially from the council uh, for every fire station to have an ambulance. Yeah, sure. I'll start on the first one. And then Sarah, Keith, if you want to have anything else, chime in. Um, development and density are an issue citywide. It's changing the landscape of our community from a suburban community to really an urban community. And that's validated by work we've done in the standards of cover study. Uh, which essentially looks at our, our station placement, apparatus, staffing, response times. And uh, what we found in that study is that Berkeley is the second most dense city in California of the top 51 most populated cities. So I did not, you know, I, I knew we were dense. I did not realize that was the level, but it makes sense when we think about the types of calls we run on and the types of challenges we face. We really face metro challenges with a suburban uh, department budget. So part of our long-term plans are to uh, realign our department operations to that of a metro agency. Uh, that means we're looking at staffing in the downtown in a different way. We're looking at uh, policies, procedures, how many units we send to different types of calls. And the evacuation study um, is gonna provide us a citywide um, layer uh, of real-time traffic data so we can really actually model the things that you're talking about and understand how the entire city will be impacted by any type of wildfire or evacuation scenario that we program into to that um, 
software once we have that that map layer. Um, did I miss anything, Sarah? Yeah, the only thing that I would add to what the chief said, Carol, um, is that we built into the contract a mechanism to use that existing layer and then update it based on proposed development or proposed roadway changes so that we can really go into these um, these different development proposals in an informed way that we don't have a mechanism for just yet. Uh, so we're really excited to see what we learn with the baseline information for what's already in place and what's about to be in place. And we also are glad to have that, uh, that way to better assess moving forward. Uh, your second question is, um, that is a complex question. I'm going to try to answer with uh, as best I can and, and uh, give a succinct answer. Uh, so there are seven fire stations. We have um, four of those stations that have ambulances, and uh, the other three stations do not have ambulances in them. Um, and that is the ambulances are deployed based on the prevalence of emergency medical incidents, and also uh, that deployment has been validated by an external a uh, vendor who looked at response times and uh, as they relate to best practices. So uh, in terms of what it would, no problem. In terms of what it would take to uh, deploy ambulances to those remaining fire stations, um, there are several major issues. The, the first being that the stations themselves are not uh, large enough. They're small neighborhood fire stations. So there's not enough bedrooms. There's not enough apparatus bay space. Um, so we are, you know, in in the in the remodel, the fire facilities master planning that plan that we're bringing to council next week, we're not um, we're not asking to increase those stations um, to be big enough to house an ambulance because um, to do that would add um, millions and millions of dollars to each project. Uh, in addition to that, then you have to have the staffing. Um, at each station, and you're looking at about $800,000 per year per ambulance, plus the actual ambulance costs. Um, we are going to be deploying more ambulances in the system so we can better use the resources we have. And we're focused on really um, getting triaging calls to get the right resource to the right call so that our ambulances are more available. Uh, that is the bigger issue right now, is our ambulances are as busy as ambulances in downtown Los Angeles and they're going to a lot of calls they don't need to go on so we're focused on um on really uh, getting some of those calls out of the 911 system uh and and i think a stat that kind of uh maybe will put some people to ease is uh berkeley for the period of 2015 to 2020 and we we're about to get the um 2020 to 2023 uh, data but for that period of time, Berkeley had the highest cardiac arrest survival rate in the county and one of the highest in the nation. And that is, and I'm not using the, um, you survive and you're in a care home and you're unable to do anything. That's the actual, I walk out of the hospital um, fully functional on my own, both mentally and physically. So um, that only occurs because of the response times that we have, the deployment we have, the technology and the training of our responders. Um, there's a lot more to that, but I'll stop there. Uh, just uh, real quick, just to jump off, I, sometimes we get a lot of questions about that particular one. And even though there's not an ambulance in each of the firehouses, we do have paramedics on every single rig in the city. Um, and so the engines have a fast response time, four to six minutes. Um, and so they can get that care to the community member even before the ambulance gets, gets to the scene. They have everything the ambulance would have to start any of those uh, life safety measures that uh, Sprague was just talking about. So, yes. Thank you. Great. The next um, speaker is Lori Volan. Hi, Lori. Thank you for a great presentation and congratulations on your high cardiac survival rate. That is remarkable. Um, I wanted to find out if there was any discussion about creating in Tilden uh, fire breaks um, so that since you said that's the most likely scenario for a urban wildlife interface fire, uh, we're trying to mitigate the risk on this side. What's being done to mitigate the risk on that side? Great question. 
Um, so outside of our jurisdiction, so we don't have um, direct authority over that that work. Um, Chief Winokur, um, if he was still on here, would tell you that he's engaged with the park district in working with them to ensure that work occurs. The park district themselves is doing a bunch of great work um, in some areas adjacent to the city. Um, as we all know, the park is massive and um, extends through a number of jurisdictions. So um, they have a lot of priorities that they're trying to uh, both mitigate initially and then uh, maintenance. But uh, when you see the goats up there, that's fire mitigation work. Um, they've removed an incredible amount of uh, vegetation and trees along Grizzly Peak. Um, and uh, just so you know the scope of, of uh, or the plan that they're operating on is uh, the result of a plan that was developed 10 years ago. Uh, they were sued when that plan was developed and it took about 10 years for the plan to get through the, the, um, the lawsuit. So they're working under kind of strict controls under what they can and cannot do. Um, we, are, we, we have definitely increased communication with them. So we understand the work that they're doing and we're comfortable, make sure we're comfortable with it. And we advocate uh, where we think, when we think that um, more work needs to be done in specific areas. Keith? Yeah, uh, just to, um, we are uh, work closely with uh, East Bay Regional Park. They took us on a great tour of uh, some of the other work they've been doing in the last four years. Uh, one of those was the goats uh, that are seen along, you know, Wildcat Canyon, Tilden, uh, Sibley Regional Park uh, for a total of like, I think it was like two, just under 240 acres. Um, there was Wildcat Canyon has had an additional 31 acres bordering like the Kensington area and the nature area. Uh, and all this is being done with uh, uh, goats as well. Uh, in 2022, uh, with assistance and guidance from um, past management, they were able to target uh, and treat 120 acres uh, of the French broom and other weedy species. Um, a lot of follow-up work goes with that. They just don't hit it once, but they, it's continual. Um, and then they also have done a lot of uh, initial treatment this last year with funding from different agencies uh, to create an approximately 100 foot wide fuel shade, uh, wide fuel, uh, uh, shaded fuel break, um, which uh, removed trees susceptible to failure that were along the, the length of the loop road in Tilden. Um, they have, they, they recognize they have a long way to go. It's a slow process sometimes for them because they're under a different, different jurisdiction. Um, but they have uh, 14 acres, uh, their, I should say their staff saw over 14 acres of fuel reduction and tree thinning in the stone wall, the Claremont Canyon corridor, um, work targeted with thinning and removing a lot of the unhealthy and unstocked, overstocked eucalyptus uh, uh, strand. But, um, and there's some work that they're doing with carburet carbonators, but we won't get into that. But they are doing a lot of work up there that we typically don't see. And they recognize that they have a lot of work to do, especially on those hillsides that uh, when wind blows, it's going to be directly into Berkeley. I'll say that kind of related piece that we do have control over is uh, we're, we're looking at some fire modeling that's going to help us understand where's the most likely uh, pathways that fire is going to come out of the park. And uh, there's fewer than you think. Uh, where we have uh, kind of direct fire coming out of the park. So we're going to be focusing our efforts on uh, the perimeter perimeter properties and parcels um, in those specific areas. So that's, that is a kind of defensive action we can take. Thanks for the question. Lori, next question. Um, I just want to say it's getting very late. It's 10 to 9. And I think we'll take two more questions. If we don't get to your question uh, tonight verbally, please write to my office and we will um, we'll get you an answer. Kathleen Kelly is next. Hi, Kathleen. Kathleen, can you unmute? There's a little red microphone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, let's see, we, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, congratulations again, Chief Sprague, on this past event on Tuesday evening. It's wonderful to have you in a permanent position. And we're really thrilled also, Susan, with all the wonderful activity that's going on right now with the entire fire department and your leadership in our district. One of the things that several people have brought up is so many senior citizens are living in the hills. They are house rich and pocket poor, whatever the term is. 
And there's a real concern about how these people are going to go and where they would go if they needed to leave on a short notice or even a two day notice. And there have been some suggestions that the city may have places available for them to go. But we're, there's some confusion in conversations that people are having about where would they go. And I wonder what the city's discussing about that issue. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, sure. So I think we really want to encourage community members uh, that plans that they can make, understanding their own needs and their own relationships, be they with friends or family, are going to be able to provide um, a more comfortable setup than a, a shelter that the city can establish. Um, we do encourage people to make uh, plans with friends and family in the area to have a place to stay in these you know, circumstances of extreme fire weather. We mentioned that it's two days that we've had since 2020. So uh, we recognize that um, it could be an imposition if it was uh, many months per year or, or you know, even less than that. But I, we also have in, uh, in the past and plan to continue uh, to secure reduced hotel rates with lo local hotels for use during extreme fire weather. Uh, but I think, you know, Kathleen, your, your point is still very well taken. Um, and I do want to emphasize that if there is a fire that does occur, then a huge part of what our response will entail is, of course, setting up evacuation centers, setting up shelter sites. And because, like Chief Sprague mentioned, we're pretty dense here in Berkeley, uh, that effort is going to not only involve the city, but also involve our partners at the county and the state. So it would be a regional effort to um, provide housing to people uh, after a fire evacuation. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're uh, experiencing right now is that this is a new idea, um, this idea of asking people to leave their homes prior to a fire igniting. And it really has come up because we've spent many, many years saying, if you just put that go bag by the door and are ready to go when we tell you to, that that will be enough. And we recognize you know, that that's, that's really not the case. And we wanna be really upfront with people about what we understand the hazard and risk to be so that they can take to say, make decisions rather with the resources that they have available. So, you know, we're, we're early on in this process. What I would like to see personally as an emergency manager, um, you know, is that maybe in 10 years, the idea would take, on, take hold that fire weather is a major concern and that we'd be able to tap into those state and federal resources to provide that support to community members, recognizing exactly those challenges that you're bringing up. So, you know, I appreciate you bringing them up and we're, we're working and we're interested in uh, community members' feedback. And right now the challenge for us is that Berkeley is kind of going it alone with trying to really speak the truth <laughs> to all of you um, and those systems that we have in place for uh, fires when they do occur aren't yet available to community members of, for fire weather. Okay, the last question is from Jason Calogiros. Jason. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, it's a, about a, it's a density and a zone zero question. Um, I'm wondering uh, what sort of recourse, um, you know, a homeowner might have um, in a situation where say a neighbor's vegetative growth is intruding on your own uh, five foot defensible space, your your own zone zero. Um, yeah, just basically. Duncan, you wanna handle that one? I'm sure you never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I, I can try. I, I think what's important to understand is that we're, our goal is to do inspections on every home. So every home will get an assessment and as I mean, obviously, as you're saying, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone wants to go ahead and do the vegetation management that we're asking them to do. However, um, the inspections will require will require that they actually take action around the vegetation management. That said, 
we're I mean, I, I, I mean, I was having a conversation about this today with a resident. Um, we really encourage neighbors to work together. I, I can't reiterate enough that this is a community effort and that cooperation between neighbors and neighborhoods is what we are striving for. I think if we can get the information to people, there, there's gonna be a period of time where people need to, where public education and, and getting the information to people is gonna be imperative so that when you have a conversation with your neighbor, they're working with the same uh, set of statistics and the same information that you are. Um, we encourage cooperation and where we have to come in and engage people, we will. Uh, just again, we're going to look at every home. So everyone's going to get an assessment of what they need to do. And we're going to rely on neighborhoods to really work together to solve some of these problems. But where we can where, where we can intervene and, and be of help, we will. Okay. Um, that's that's a that's happens on a, almost a daily basis out there. Duncan, are we are we enforcing zone zero regulations already? So vegetation in zone zero, if it's determined that it's uh, hazardous to the home or the home next to it, yeah, we're we're I mean we're enforcing and we're letting people know that there are violations and they have a period of time to to take care of that. Thirty days, uh, roughly thirty days, and then a reinspection, and then another fourteen to fifteen days. Um, before we have to escalate things. But again, our, our goal is to not have to get to that point. We're hoping with the, with the information, the education that we won't have to uh, make it make things too difficult for people. Okay, and uh, when an inspection occurs on my neighbor's house, can I view the report? Well, you won't be able to see your neighbor's report. Um, you'll, everyone has their own individual report that's, specific to their property. Um, that's important just for privacy reasons. But I think the issues are obvious to people and you know, um, you're not gonna know exactly what the violation is on a neighbor's home. But I, I think again, this, this is a lot about public education. We're in a phase of like letting people know like what the issues are and how they need to handle them. Um, so I don't think it'll be too difficult to understand what the threats are between neighbors and within neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, so I hope that this evening, everybody who's attended is inspired to um, step up and take responsibility for your own property and reach out to your neighbor and communicate with them about your concerns about what's happening on that side of the fence. And I wanna thank the fire department. Um, I wanna assure the citizens of Berkeley that the collaboration between the city council and the fire department has never been stronger. In, in my experience, and that's almost 30 years now, um, we are all working together as a team to try to keep you safe. So thank you very, very much, everybody, and um, have a good night.